Good Saturday morning. I'm glad you could join us on another hot Saturday uh, on Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen. This other guy with me is Dave Riccio. And every single Saturday at 11 o'clock, we are here to help you with your car in Bumper to Bumper Radio. You, the motoring public, we want you to have a better overall car experience, whether it's a repair, a new purchase, you're in the shop and you've got a question you need to have answered, we are here for you. And if you want to get involved in the show, don't be shy. Just give us a call, 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. And today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, how not to get bamboozled by your auto repair shop, open phones as always, and nine ways or more to make your car go 200,000 miles or more. Well, in the old days, 100,000 miles, a car was totally worn out. We're always talking about how the rules have changed. I came across an article that talks about the nine ways to get your car to go 200,000 miles. Cars, average car age on the road right now is 11 years old. 15,000 miles a year being the average. That's 150,000 miles on a car. Those are vehicles running around every day. The car you're next to has 150,000 miles on it. And that's no big deal. That's not a big deal. So how do you make them go 200,000 miles and not cost you a fortune, not have to buy an engine, not have to buy a transmission? And I would agree with most of this article. It's got nine ways. I think they're missing a key important tenth way. But uh, first is regular maintenance, and the word there that is key, if you're listening, is regular. <laughs> it can't be kind of sort of went to reactive maintenance. It's regular maintenance. There's part a of, Metamucil for the part car of your to keep deal. it regular, Dave. Is that what keep you're it talking? regular. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you wanna, you've got an owner's manual full of regular maintenance. If you want your car to go 200,000 miles, you're going to follow the severe timetable, not the regular. And if you live in Arizona, you should be following the severe anyway. So that's going to be oil changes generally every 5,000 miles. Uh, that is definitely something to follow and that's at minimum as far minimum. as as far as follow the manufacturers follow your guideline in the owner's manual at minimum in the severe maintenance timetable but the two that are crucially left out or undersold is the service of the radiator and the cooling system you know gm says ah it's service you're cooling every hundred thousand miles well that's a crock we know that's a crock and the other one is the transmission you know some of these manuals say service the transmission lifetime. It's lifetime fill. You don't have to service it. Yeah, when it blows up, we put new fluid in it. Some of them say do it every 100,000 miles. 100,000 miles is way too long. I would say at minimum do it every 50,000 miles. My recommendation at the shop is every twenty to 30,000 miles, and I think that's completely realistic. What we're trying to do is keep the car, drive it for 200,000 miles, and never have a catastrophic repair. You know, if we can just stick with maintenance, 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 not have to buy a transmission, not have to buy an engine. By the way, if you need one, Tri-City Transmission. <laughs> <laughs> well, shameless but, plug a there. Shameless but. plug. But you don't want to have to come see me. Well, you would much rather, Dave, I'm sure, be doing transmission services and minor adjustments and doing overhauls there it's it's just like us we don't want to put engines and cars no on. it's we no don't fun want your to, car to break it's down. no fun to call people and give them bad news it's more fun to call them and say yeah not a big deal got to take care of you're on your way yeah. so regular maintenance your maintenance timetable in your owner's manual severe duty we want to follow that at minimum plus we're going to throw in their engine coolant got to take care of that they don't cover that one good enough and the other thing we're going to throw in there is transmission service because they don't cover that one good enough either we won't go into great de- detail about it but there's been some blogs and we've talked about it before the other things that are completely ignored and you'll never find them in an owner's manual is fuel injection cleaning in engine decarbon Mm. those are big maintenance items uh there's something that should be done at a professional shop not at the quickie lube not at the drive-through joint there there's more to (laughs) it than 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 just squirting a can of sauce in there so to speak but those are some maintenance items that we want to be looking at at 30 60 that's another one where the rules have changed you got the old cowboy farmer on the radio saying hey you don't need to do that kind of stuff you know late model cars with direct injection you got (laughs) to get the carbon out of there yeah valve adjustment is one that's underrated but um you know so we'll we'll go on then what we got to get through nine so your senses you got to use your senses when you're driving your car and one of the biggest senses is sight so you get in your car in the morning it's dark in your garage you get in the car you pull out you go to work you drive home it's dark in the garage 
you got to do a pre-flight walk around in the light from time to time. Just walk around your car and look at me. See if there's no dents in there. Maybe somebody dented your car. The tires low or the wheel. But I say just the opposite, Dave. We're not typically in Arizona. We're not. We're getting in the car when it's light in the morning, and we're leaving when it's light. Maybe once in a while. Do it in the dark. Go out there in the dark and see how your headlights aim against the garage door and and, and look at the turn signals. Or you know maybe you're in the drive-through at the car in front of you. You can see a lot of things in the tailgate of the car in front of you. Uh, use it for a mirror occasionally. Easy, quick checks. So do a walk around from time to time. The next, and the other thing you got to do is look at when you back out of your parking spot. Look at where you just came from. Is there any yeah. puddles there? A little red stuff. That's my department. Red stuff anymore could be engine coolant. Is there any green stuff? What kind of stuff are you seeing? Are you seeing any oil? My my neighbor brought his Mercedes into the to the shop and I said it's leaking oil. That car doesn't leak any oil. I'm like, have you ever looked at the street in front of your house? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so look, pay pay attention because again we're avoiding the catastrophic repairs. You avoid, you know, if you ignore an oil leak, well that oil's leaking on something else and it's damaging that something else, or it's going to run out of oil. You know, so you got to use sight. The next one is smell, and people don't understand this, but I'll I'll walk through a parking lot and I'll say that car over there is leaking coolant, that car over there has got a valve cover leaking. <laughs> yeah. I can smell it. And people don't understand it, but I can smell. Coolant is the biggest one that you, you want to smell for. It's a sweet smell, and you want to catch a coolant leak beca- before it becomes a coolant rupture. Because when it becomes a rupture, that gauge isn't going to go up real quick, and you're going you're gonna, to like pull over when your car starts running bad and all the red lights are on and you've if, already wrecked the engine. If you have a catastrophic loss of coolant, it goes fast. It, it, it will, goes will real fast. My neighbor, Rick, bless his heart, he just lost his engine in his Toyota because the radiator blew when he was on the highway. But the, the temperature never went up. He pulled over when the engine started running bad. Well, that's way too late. <laughs> well, I've had, I've defended a couple students. You know, their dad gets mad or, or the spouse going, why weren't they paying attention to the temperature gauge? Well, if the water comes out fast and it's going behind you as you go 60 miles an hour down the road, you're not in tune with those mm-hmm. uh, smells and or maybe look in the rearview mirror. There's no coolant to make that heat transfer to the sensor. Pay it's attention not- to weird smells for sure. We want to avoid that. The next one, say no to short trips. I don't know if I'm buying off on this one. Matt says I don't know. He didn't know if he buys off on it either. But the idea is if the car never gets up to full operating temperature, it, it needs to. Well, before the show, Dave, we talked. You have a modern fuel-injected car versus an older carbureted car or even an older, say, 90s fuel-injected car. They're not as efficient. So if for me, if I – I mean, I'm always at bashes. It's like a circle K mm-hmm. to me. I'm always there. I talk to you you've got an army of kids. Milk, bread, and eggs <laughs> constantly running to bashes. Well, those short trips are no big deal because I'm driving 15, 20 miles a day plus trips throughout the day doing business and, and whatever. That's no big deal with that short trip. But the short trip we're talking about is when you work one mile from home and you drive a mile to and a mile back and a mile to and a mile back and you've driven eight miles or 16 miles in a week. And I got to tell you, if you're driving a mile to work, drive four miles to get home. Go around the block. Do something. Get that engine up to operating temperature. Or that just increase your social life, man. <laughs> go check out the west side. If you live in the west, go check out the east side. It's like a different country the last time I checked. <laughs> You're, uh, I don't know about you sometimes. So short drives, uh, use synthetic oil. You know, hey, again, we're going to – this car, we're not worried about, you know – we want it to last 200,000 miles, and at 200,000 miles, we don't want to have some big catastrophic thing because at 200,000 miles, if we decide to part with it, it still is valuable to somebody else. So synthetic oil, I'm a big fan of synthetic oil. That's what I run in my car, and I change oil every 5,000 miles like clockwork. i got to take it somewhere else because I can never get into my own shop. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's Cobbler's Kids, right? Well, the I don't know. We're, maybe we're getting out of oil. Regular maintenance, Dave, we got uh, running out of oil, running out of time here. <laughs> we covered transmission fluid. The sense of sound. We talked about sight, but sound. I, I make the comparison to your Lazy Boy or your mattress or your tennis shoes. You bought these things brand new. You've worn them every day. You sit in it every day. You sleep in it every day. Whatever the case, somebody else gets in it and goes, what are you? What's going on? This thing's falling apart. Listen to what your car. You get so accustomed as this thing denigrates and wears out over time. You don't hear. You become accustomed well, to these things. It's like when you see a nephew that you only see every six months or a year. You go, "Wow, man, he sprouted up big time quickly." Well, he grew every day. 
You know, you just didn't notice it because you, <laughs> you weren't around. So it looks like it, it grew big time. It's it's one of the curses that I endure is every time I get in somebody's car, I find five things wrong with it. No one wants to have me in their car because they know it's going to cost them money. I'm like, wow, man, your differential bearings are going out. Well, my wife, I drove, drove her car a couple weeks ago, and I'm like, what? This thing is noisy. She's like, well, it's always like this. No, it's not. So when we were on vacation last week, we'd take it into the shop while I'm gone. Two bad rear wheel bearings. I mean, the wheel wasn't falling off. It's just noisy. You get out of touch because you see it every day. So put somebody else in your car. When we come back, we're going to find about, out about Matt breaking down on the road and his trip to Nevada because he waited the last minute to get maintenance. And we're taking your calls at 602-277-5827. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with my sometimes co-host, Matt Allen. And we are here helping you with your car. We've got open phones at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Anything you want to talk about in regards to your car, if you want to talk about maintenance today, we're talking about making it go 200,000 miles. I don't think we quite got to all nine reasons, and I said there was going to be a tenth, so we'll work those in here somewhere. But I do want to talk about, Matt, you waiting to the last day to take your car to the shop. <laughs> and uh, that's just, that's not practicing what you preach. <laughs> but we know there's still some summer but, road trip. Go ahead. But here's the deal. My car is in the shop every, I'm talking about my excursion. It's in the shop every 5,000 miles. I'm pretty confident at any time that I can just get in that thing and down the road. I'm out of here. Mm. So I was when I was talking, you know, talking to your people about you putting belts on there at the last minute. I, yeah, I don't know if that's a good you idea. You know, it didn't really need a belt, and it just clicked ninety thousand miles. And I thought, well, the belt wasn't great, but where I was driving, I mean, I went. Seven, I drove home Monday, seven hundred and fifteen miles, and I was. I mean, we're out in the boonies. It. And when you've got a carload of seven people, we are a family of seven. A lot of bambinos running around. Over there. <laughs> yeah, there is. <laughs> there, um, you know, you, there's not a tow truck that can fit us all. There, there's not where we were. There's no. There's not even a town for an hour sometimes, let alone a place to get a rental car if you can find one big enough to cram everybody in. Uh, so you know, I did belt and belt tensioners kind of at the last minute, but I did have a problem. Luckily, it wasn't a breakdown issue, but my air conditioner quit blowing out of the right spot. It was blowing out of the dashboard instead out of the vents. It just suddenly started happening. Still was able to keep the car cool, but I'll tell you what, mm. it, it wasn't, there's something it wasn't the about same. having that air blowing on you. I guess it's the ceiling fan effect. The room is really no cooler. It it's sounds just, really swampy to me. Uh, on the leather seats, yeah. <laughs> it you know, was a little so, uncomfortable. <laughs> it, but that's just that's another point I wasn't even thinking about. No matter what you check out, no matter how how proactive you are, you still have these weird little deals that happen. Nobody can predict. I think it has a, a bad AC mode door actuator. That's a little motor in the dash panel there that directs it. You want to come out the heat. You want it to come out the the frost, a little bit of both, out the vents or, or where you want it to go. So well, you can never predict the stuff. And, and it's still got 715 miles worth of bugs plastered all over it rolled in here Monday night. And, I guess I'll spend the afternoon at the car wash. Well, up for this segment, we are going to go with Bill in Chandler. Looks like he's got a 2008 Dodge Nitro. Go ahead, Bill. You are on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yes, uh, air conditioning problem. My air conditioner works perfect about 75% of the time, and no rhyme or reason uh, in the morning at 90 degrees or in the afternoon at 108 degrees. The air will be blowing cold and then disappear. Um Park the car, get back in it, might work again. Shut it off, turn it back on. Uh, Ten minutes later, it might work again or it might not. When you say, is it still blowing? In, in other words, we still have airflow? We or still is have the, airflow, but it's warm. But the temperature is warm. Don't, don't talk to Matt. Apparently his doesn't work either. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, my, my, hey, hey, hey. My Most blows. of the problems with air conditioning, I, I understand, You know, be it the blend door motors or compressor not running or low on Freon. But when it works, it's cold. Well, you have I, to turn it down. I would say in this case, it's not a refrigerant issue. It's probably it's not low on charge, although it may be low on charge. You, it wouldn't be uncommon to find a 2008 car low on charge. Yeah, well, the other idea your... was I just had it at the dealer uh, a little over a month ago, and uh, I explained this whole situation to them working great and then not working, and they gave me a estimate of $431 to replace O-rings on the condenser. 
mm. which they didn't address my issues, so I didn't get that done at the time. And here it is a month and a half later, and it still works 75% of the time, <laughs> okay. either well, perfect or not at all. That pro- that shows my point that it's that it's probably, I mean, you very well may need a service, but that's not your problem. So Electrical uh, issue. I would imagine there's an intermittent electrical issue going on, whether you have a relay or some kind of controller that, that's failing. There's something that's not telling that compressor to come on. Or maybe there is something, to, maybe it is being told to come on. So you might be able to tell. If you open the hood, turn the air conditioner on, and it's not blowing cold, but yet both radiator fans come on. You also look down and see that compressor, the actual center part of it's spinning. Is the compressor really running? Because you'll see that clutch coming on, on and off. Click, 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 click. Right. And you can so see maybe that there's, Yeah, maybe there's power to it and that the electronic coil or the coil inside the magnet is not working anymore. So there's a couple. Th- it's definitely an electrical issue. It's just you got to back into it and find it. And somebody needs to duplicate the problem. I like what he said. They tried to tell me I needed O-rings, compressor this. He said it didn't address my concern. That that Perfect. That is really what you want to do, Bill. He said, okay, here's my problem. Okay, Somebody offers you something that doesn't fix your problem. You're, you were completely right not to do it. So as consumers, when you have a concern, bring it in and you say, okay, how does this resolve my concern? Because you know, that's really what you want to get to. You don't want them to say... Your real problem is an intermittent AC issue. You don't have a problem with this thing blowing cold. So it may seem like there's there's little differences in what people ask and what people say. And this is another one I harp on. The automotive invoice should have your concern. What you said in your words should be listed on there, and then it should have what the cause, what they found to be the cause for your concern, and then their recommendation. So I'm telling everybody, three C's on an auto repair invoice. And Con- four. Con- yeah, uh, well, I just- interrupted you the other day but confirmation is the last one yeah complain or concern the cause what caused the failure and then the correction the correction and then confirmation of what we corrected yeah we test drove it we found this we found that and if you're looking for a shop in chandler ads automotive diagnostics specialties no reason to be at the dealer on a 2008 car i say if it's not free there's no reason to return so give give Greg a shot there at ADS. Well, let's take up let's sneak in uh, Rick in Awatuki on a 2003 Toyota Camry. Go ahead, Rick. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, thanks, guys. Uh, my question is this: listening to you about uh, you know synthetic oil, and uh, I uh, this Camry has got 130,000 miles on it, 128,000 miles on it. And at what point does it make sense not to switch to synthetic oil? And I, and also if uh, you know on my Harley, I, I often question that. I'm using regular oil on both vehicles. And uh, but I listen to all the pros of synthetic, but but people I've heard people say, oh God, no, don't ch- don't switch at this point. So appreciate your comments, thanks, guys. I, I well, first off, on the Harley, I made the mistake one time my dirt bike of putting synthetic motor oil, <laughs> yeah. in it, and it didn't work so well for the wet clutch. Right. So, so definitely be careful with with anything you put in the Harley. Uh, but as far as the car goes. I'm not. I think it used to be an old wives' tale, or maybe it was true in the early '80s. Don't put synthetic in because it will leak. It I, definitely did that. I mean, I, I noticed it happened. And back when synthetic first became popular, we put it in. All of a sudden, these cars have leaks they didn't have. Well, the additives and the packages. I mean, they're designed to really integrate into a car that's been running conventional. And, and I would say, if you have an oil leak, maybe before you, if you're already using synthetic, stick with it. That's great to do. But if you think you want to make that change. Go in and make sure you don't have any oil leaks first. Because if you do, they may get just a little bit worse. It's a little slipperier. It may not be worth the money. Maybe go to a synthetic blend. There's so many options there. When we come back, one of the the topics that gets me hot under the collar is the two-step selling process. So when we're talking about how not to get bamboozled by the auto shop, and we got open lines at 602-277-5827. My pappy said, son, you're going to drive me to drinking if you don't stop driving that hot rod Lincoln. Bumper to Bumper on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. He is Matt Allen, and we are here helping you, the motoring public, have a better car repair experience. We're doing that by educating you and answering questions that help other listeners. So if you want to give us a call, 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. And I think we got through about maybe six of the nine things that were listed in that article, but you know what, I'm going to go right for number 10. Number 10 is crucial. If you're going to have a car and you're going to have a relationship for 200,000 miles with this car, 
you're going to want to do it with the same person. You know, you're not going to go shop, shop, hop and shop, shop to shop because you're going to spend, spend way more money in the long run by having a bunch of people hodgepodge repair your car. You want one guy. Do it. That's going to take care of it. He's going to he's going to hold your hand all the way through for 200,000 miles. This is a long relationship. This is uh, at 15,000 miles a year. That's uh, 10, 15 years you're going to have this car. Well, yeah, it's one person to do the repair. If you're at a good shop, maybe it's always going back to the same technician. You're always comfortable knowing what they're doing. You, there's a comfort level to ask questions, get good answers, but also... We've had it happen to us, Dave. We've had the regular customer, and then for whatever reason, the the spouse takes the car out to, um, you know, maybe out and get an oil change, and then suddenly they've got. Hey, we see the car and we're like, where'd this come from? Oh, my so and so took the car into another, and they see the say I needed this X service. We just did that seven thousand miles ago. They just went surfing off the odometer found a repair and, and you've just wasted money so there, there's a whole lot of reasons to let just let somebody handle it get that we always preach the relationship well the relationship and you're going to spend less money in the long run you know if you're if you pick and choose you know i'm gonna do this repair here and that repair there and this repair there and a maintenance here no one is it's not congruent it doesn't line up so everyone's got their own ideas and their own ways about going about it and we just want one philosophy philosophy for that car for 200,000 miles. Keep it in sequence and and uh, keep your car on the road. Make that 200,000 mile mark. So up first this segment, we're going to go with Todd, who's got a 1988 Toyota Corolla, who's probably got at least 100,000 miles on it. Go ahead, Todd. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, thanks for taking my call, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, my car actually has 234,000 miles on it. Barely broken I'm in. Cur- uh, yeah, and I'm... Uh, trying to figure out what you know type of oil i'm supposed to put in it uh, i've heard about uh, uh like mobile one high mileage I, mean, I just want to get your take on that because i just listened to your last listener and there was uh you know no synthetic so my take would be just on on a on that card just stick with whatever you've been doing you've obviously done something right or somebody did to get it to 200 and 30,000, 30,000 miles, 30, yeah. 40,000 miles. Stick with, you know, on, on an older car like that, that's, well, I don't know if that's carbureted. Yeah, that's probably yeah. fuel injected. It, it, if it's carbureted, I might just stick with the 3,000-mile oil change with conventional oil and, and just do your regular service. Do what you've always been doing. No just, no reason to change that one. No. I mean, it's, if you could go to a 5,000-mile change. And, and, Dave, on an older car or the higher mileage cars, Again, it's not necessarily the oil that we want to change, although we do that because that's the service that gets you in the door. That's for you to come to us, not for us to get you you in the door. I don't mean it like that. But that gives you the opportunity to have somebody else that knows what they're doing, looking at your tire pressures, looking at all the other components on the car, a quick overview for a very little amount of money that you have to spend typically. Get it looked at because it's it's falling apart in between oil changes or it has the chance to. You want to catch those things, especially as you get into the higher end of the mileage. Well, on these later model cars, because we did talk about the synthetic. I mean, some of these want synthetic out of the box, so the car's new. They're recommending synthetic oil to you. Absolutely. And for the ones that don't, I am recommending synthetic oil to you. These engines are different. We haven't seen a decade worth of you know, some of them are, they haven't been out for a decade, so we haven't seen that many miles on them. But for the people that put a lot of miles on these cars, you're seeing things like sludge. Well, and the other thing is don't go cheap. I I don't know how many times it happens, but not as often as it used to. But someone comes in with this 2011 Buick and you say, you need this oil. No, I just want the cheap stuff. They think they're being upsold. That's what the manufacturer requires. So you're compromising warranty and you're compromising performance with all the variable valve timing and different Mm. type of... The oil is used more for lubricating, more than just for lubricating. Now. It's hydraulic it's, it's, now, too. It's hydraulic oil, so you don't want to get foam and bubbles. And we're not talking about frothy, foamy <laughs> dish soap. We're talking just little small, small bits of foam par- or air in there can affect the performance of the of the engine. Well, thanks for the call, Todd. We're going to go with Cheryl in Phoenix. She's got a 2011 Toyota Sienna. Go ahead, Cheryl. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Um, my question, actually, is I drive a handicap van for a living, and I have to pay for my own gas. 
and I, I'm trying to get the best gas mileage that I can. So I'm trying to figure out what type of gas would be good, and do the gas stations make a difference? Cheryl, if you go to ktar.com and go to the bumper to bumper tab under shows, I wrote a blog about the different kinds of fuels to put in the car, whether it's premium, do you need you know the super unleaded, do you just need the basic? And, and the gist of it is use the fuel that the manufacturer rent, recommends. There's no, there's no reason to put premium unleaded in a car that doesn't require premium unre- unleaded. I can't even talk. But I think the fuel station itself does matter too. QT, I believe, is the best fuel, one of the best. Costco is great. Chevron Shell, Texaco, those are all typically what, are the, uh, what you call top tier fuels. They're top tier fuels, and that's the key. Carbon buildup in an engine is a big problem, and you want to have a top tier fuel. And besides that, you should be putting an additive in the in the fuel tank occasionally. You can do it in the shop where they can do fuel injection clean. You can add a bottle of Tecron, which you buy at Chevron. 99 out of 100 of those other bottles, or probably 97 out of 100 of the bottles that you see on the on the store at the auto parts, on the shelf at the auto parts store, I wouldn't put in my car. <laughs> There's but, a lot of them. We went down there lot. and we counted them. <laughs> so three of them. But check out that blog on KTR.com under the bumper to bumper tab, and 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 that's a good place to start. For sure. Well, thanks so much for the call, Cheryl. We are going to go with Brent in Gilbert on a 2003 Chevrolet Suburban. Go ahead, Brent. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. Good morning, guys. Good morning. I have a problem with my gauges on the uh, on my Suburban where the speedometer. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes at the, at the times when it is working, it's incorrect. It's you know telling me I'm going 110 miles an hour when I'm going 30. And uh, also the the gas gauge as well is incorrect. And I'm kind of wondering if there's something simple I should be looking at to try to fix that. There's nothing simple. I mean, it's a pretty typical problem for that vintage of Chevrolet. Uh, we repair them quite a bit at the transmission shop because we'll do a transmission repair for somebody. Their speedometer, odometer, something's not working. we got to warranty the repair. So we will uh, we actually remove their speedometer, the head, the cluster, they whole call cluster it. cluster assembly with all the gauges. It's with all, all the gauges. Year. And the whole thing can be repaired. It's not a super expensive repair. I mean, it's certainly not money you want to spend. But it can be repaired, and it is pretty much a pattern failure, I would say. So that cluster needs to be either replaced or rebuilt. And it can be rebuilt. A lot of shops at Bumper to Bumper Radio can, can coordinate that for you. Yeah, it's pretty. I'm surprised. You know, you don't see those like we used to see them. They were all every the week, time. two or three times a week. I, I thought they'd all been fixed by now. <laughs> so but. thanks so much for the call, Brent. We uh, got open lines at 602-277-5827. We're going to go with Joe in Tempe on a 2004 Saturn Ion. Go ahead, Joe. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. Uh, my wife has a 04 Saturn Ion, and for some reason it keeps – it. when you're driving the car, it works fine. But when you go to stop at like a stoplight, it will overheat. And I, when I've shut it off, I've checked that the fan still is working and the coolant. I don't feel any coolant. It's full on coolant, and I'm not quite sure what's going on with that. Has there been any coolant repairs in the recent past or cooling system repairs? Uh, no, not for a, a while. I mean, not no. And how does the air conditioner work? So you say it overheats in traffic, right? Yes. The air conditioner works great when you're driving. Once you stop driving, or when, like once you stop at a stoplight and it might be an extended period, then the AC starts to start blowing hot. And that was my first clue that there was something really wrong. And then I'll watch the temperature gauge start to creep up. And that's when I started getting really worried. I don't want her sitting there to right. really mess something up. This time of year, I would expect the question to be the opposite, to be my AC is not working. Forget about the car. <laughs> right. But those, uh, I, I'm going to bet, I don't have any money in my wallet today, but I would bet everything in there if there was something that that we have a cooling fan issue. We, well, we he said a, he said he looked at the fan, but he could still have a fan issue. Why would that be? Well, they're intermittent. Sometimes the fan's not working. It's a multi-speed fan, yes. so it could be blowing on a low. That same fan may may run at two or three different speeds depending on on what duty cycle the the computer runs the relay or however that particular system works. Um, 
you know, we see the fan not working, open up the car and just give it a tap with the end of a screwdriver or spin it, it with your right finger up. real quick. And, and it, and it, well, yeah, you <laughs> I don't know. recommend spinning with yeah. my finger. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if you know what you're doing. <laughs> And I do have all my fingertips still. But Surprised. give it a quick spin, and, and that gives it a jump start, so to speak. But both of those symptoms, I guarantee, are the same problem, and it's a control issue with the fan or the fan itself not working. Well, I mentioned before the break, bamboozled by the auto shop and the two-step selling process. One of the things that people cannot stand about the auto shop is you go in, they tell you the repair is going to be $500, and then they call you back. And they say, oh, Mrs. Mrs. Jones, it's uh, something else, you know, and it's actually going to be $850. And your bill went up. So I don't care if it's the auto shop or the roofer or the plumber. When they got to come back and ask you for more money, that's never a good feeling because at this point, something's already taken apart. Well, that happens. Sometimes we're doing a repair. Good, honest technicians doing a repair. There was something unforeseen, something we didn't see coming, and something that had to be added to the project. There's no mischief in that. It's not intentional or anything like that. When you're working with a good shop, they hate to call you back and tell you that there's more money that needs to be spent. It's agonizing. Totally. Now, on the other end, there is some people, and I just what got me fired up, and I wrote a blog about it. it should be up here on KTR in the next couple of days on their website is the two-step selling process. I recently talked to someone who recently went through a training at one of these chains, national chain, and the two-step selling process is, he said, a timing belt. We're going to do a timing belt on a car. The coupon it says we can get a timing belt done for $300. So customer comes in, yep, 300 bucks for a timing belt. You now now mm-hmm. they pull the front of the engine apart. You know, timing covers off, timing belt's off, you know, and then they say, you know what, Mrs. Jones, while we're in there, hmm, it's probably not a bad idea for us to do a water pump. There's just a little bit of wetness around the water pump, which I would expect at 90,000 miles anyway. Even if there was a wetness, they know that they're going to They they're know gonna they're going to need a water pump. And then, you know, those tensioners, those belt tensioners, we should do those, and the idler pulley. So all this stuff comes up. You thought you were going in for a $300 timing belt because that's what the coupon says, but now it's an $800 bill when that was the quote that you got from the first place at Mad Virginia Auto Service. Dave, I don't know if I'm madder at you for bringing that up when there's not enough time right now because I'm my blood's boiling. We start going through these you know, people calling on the phone, wanting prices. I'm looking for a technician. I've been interviewing people lately, and you you start to learn a lot about these sales processes. And I yes, think we need to sure. dig into that. When more. we come back, we've got Dan, Robert, and Bill, and maybe Matt will be able to vent a little more. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio with my guest host Matt Allen. <laughs> Feels like guests lately. He takes a way more vacation time than I do. I've been gone a lot this year on Saturdays for some reason, but uh, never leave your wingman. No, I think uh, you know we'll, we'll keep it on 100% full throttle for the rest of the year. I, besides you, I'm not expecting any time off. I think you're you're gone. I got but, maybe uh, one or two, but I'm I'm, I'm here for the long haul. So yeah. anyway. Before we talked, bamboozled by the auto shop, the two-step selling process. They take your car apart, and then they tell you about all the ancillary items that you should have known about up front. How do we avoid that? How do we get a repair that doesn't grow? Well, first of all, you can start with a good shop. If you need one, bumper to bumperradiocom Someone you have a relationship with. And don't go like menu pricing stuff over the phone and, and shop hopping. You want a good relationship. Uh, even if you're at a shop that does practice a two-step selling process, you can still be okay as a consumer, but you just got to ask good questions up front. So you guys are going to take my timing belt apart. Is there anything else we should be considering doing? Can this repair bill grow and how so? And when we ask them these questions, we're not, we don't want to criticize, you know, seem like we're questioning their integrity. We're just asking good questions so you know because, hey, am I going to be spending 500 bucks here? Can I expect that to be all it's going to be or is it going to be 800 bucks? Am I going to be surprised later? Well, what really torques me, <laughs> I mean, it really does, it, Dave. The, the, you're right. You've got to ask good questions. And, and if you catch yourself in that situation, you may know it because they're going to start fumbling what they say. And not everybody's a slick talker. I mean, we're not all salespeople. And, not, and there's great service advisors that that aren't aren't the slick salesmen that don't always have the right answer or don't, or, or don't respond. Just because someone's stumbling a little bit, it doesn't mean anything necessarily. But... It asks the questions. It really just tans my backside when they <laughs> they know this. They know, and the time belt's the perfect example. I, I think there's some brake issues that are a perfect example. They know uh, going into it, but they, they they rope you in the door. The 
two-step selling process is another name for bait and switch. And it's not that, it's just that they get your business away from the honest guy. So the honest guy was going to tell you 800 bucks for this timing belt thing and the tensioners and the water pump and the couple of radiator hoses and all that stuff. He's going to say, hey, for me to do a great job in your car that you're going to keep for another 100,000 miles, it's going to cost me 800 bucks. Well, that guy still may do all those things. You just may not know about him up front. So you got, you got lured out of the honest shop. And you've been brought into a shop that's going to use these little manipulative sales practices. And it's manipulative, and I just never support manipulative businesses. Well, and I think the other thing, too, is people are tuned into what they were pre-programmed into what's the price. And, and I've always, like, I tend to pick the higher price thing just because I think it's better. I'm not always right in that case, whether it's the television or having some guy, you know, the pest control guy. We've got this, this, or that. I want the better thing. Because I hate uh, doing it twice because it always costs me more money in the long run. If that, you know, the TV breaks and i got to buy a second TV, now I, you know, the first one was 800 and, you know, so I went with that. Now I had to buy it twice. Now that's 1600 If I would have spent $1,100, i would be in good shape. You know, I would have saved something money like that. cheaper in the long and, run. And you have the analogy, Dave, when we, when we first started doing this show and, and talking about these subjects was – you had a window. We're having a window put in your house, and everybody is pre-programmed to do the low bid. So the guy thinks he's going to get the job by doing the cheapest. So he comes out and says, "Oh, it's five hundred bucks." You say, "Well, gee, for five hundred dollars, how would you do this if it was your house?" And I think that's a good question to ask the car guy. How yeah, if this question. was your car? How, what else would you be doing on this repair? Is there anything else? But the guy says, "Oh God, if it was my house, I would I would do this. I would do that. Well, how much would that cost? Oh, that would be nine hundred dollars to put that window in your house, Dave." Oh, okay. Well, that's the one I don't. I don't want this other crappy right. if job. You, if you knew for two hundred extra dollars you could have a great job versus a crappy job, you would probably dig a little deeper because you only want to do it once. So or wait, or wait until you have Put more money, just a little bit. Correct. And do it. Do the job the right way. For sure. Well, we're gonna go this up first this segment with Dan in Phoenix on an O2 Chevrolet Cavalier. Go ahead, Dan. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. I just have a. Question, simple question. Uh, I'm trying to, I have a 2002 uh, Chevrolet Cavalier, and I'm trying to locate where the uh, turn signal really is. I've looked uh, under the dash and in the, you know, uh, engine compartment. Uh, I couldn't find it there. Well, Dan, is it incorporated Dan, with a turn signal? It could be part of the turn signal, or on that car, it might very well be part of the hazard switch. Is your hazard switch a red triangular button up on the dash? It's included with the turn signal, yeah. But uh, it's um, enclosed, or, you know, it's a whole... Um, is it unit. on top of the steering wheel, or is it up on the on the face of the dash panel above the radio? It's up on the steering wheel. Okay. But, well, why is it that you want to find the turn signal relay? I want to re- re- replace it. Why? <laughs> and I, why uh, do you want to replace the turn signal oh, relay? It, it, uh, it don't work now. Uh, it used to work, and I used to, you know, like hold it or uh, flick it a few times, and then now it's totally off where the hazard and the turn signal don't work. Neither one of them work well. I'm not sure off the top of my head. We're going to try looking that up while we're talking here and see if I can find an answer for you. You might want to check your owner's manual, and that might have the location of where it is. If you can get that thing to work again, listen for the tick. But I was being a little tough on you and asking you why you want to replace it. And this goes into working on Now, this is probably a cheap example. It may not be the best example. Why do, you want your, why do you want to replace it? Well, it's not working. Well, how do you know? You don't even know where it is to test it to see if it's any good or not. On a turn signal, chances are, yeah, maybe it's the flasher. The 2002 Cavalier is not an overly complicated system. But sometimes there's two turn signals flashers. Sometimes a turn signal flasher, I know on a, on a, much of the Volkswagens, a lot of cars, it's part of the hazard button switch. The switch on the dash is the relay unit. It's the flasher. It's the whole nine yards. And they're not cheap. So we need to find it to do the test check not necessarily to replace it although that one might be a five dollar deal right might not be a big deal and and it's a cheap guess if it's something easy to change well you know sometimes i think do-it-yourself auto repair it sometimes can cost you more money i'm going to give you a prime example of one i had in the shop this week uh the lady was right about what was wrong she googled it she found that there was probably she had a nissan altima she figured there was probably a problem with the brake pedal switch 
and that's why the car wasn't starting. Well, that got adjusted and adjusted wrong and ended up at a transmission shop, and she thought she needed a new transmission. So a couple of tow bills later, we put in a good brake switch and had it adjusted right. It well, didn't go so well. They did the job wrong. They overdid the switch, right? So she's driving around with the brakes on, <laughs> thinking that the transmission's no good. Meanwhile, she smoked her brakes, almost bought a transmission she didn't need if she ended up at the wrong shop. Right. And you still had to do the first repair the, uh, the second time now. So... Always a good shop, bumper to bumper radio.com. If you're looking, there's a great shops all throughout the valley, and we're here for you always every Saturday, too. And if you like us on Facebook, bumper to bumper radio.com, there's a Facebook page. We sure appreciate that. Thanks, Peter, for running the dials. Thanks, Matt, for actually coming in this weekend. Remember never to text and drive. We'll see you next week.